Returning to one of our top stories, and Anthony Albanese will make a last-ditch appeal to New South Wales and Queensland premiers to introduce a price cap on coal when National Cabinet convenes on Wednesday. Premiers Dominic Perrottet and Anastasia Palaszczuk are standing firmly and say they'll reject any proposal not including compensation for their state's generators and producers. It's little comfort for households who are buckling under the weight of increased cost and living pressures heading into this notoriously expensive and busy period. Joining us live, as he always does on a Monday, the Nationals leader, David Littleproud. Thanks so much for your time. You're in Queensland at the moment in Townsville. Good to see you. Um, the yeah. energy issue, uh, it, look, it, they promised by the end of the year. There's about three or four weeks left. It looks like this meeting will be uh, the crunch next week. Are you OK with coal caps or price caps on coal if there is compensation? Well, well look, the, the problem with this, Laura, is there's been six months of indecision. Uh, and the reality is this is a supply issue. This could have been fixed, particularly with gas. It could have been done six months ago. And now we're getting to the 11th hour when Australian families have got to scratch together a couple of thousand dollars extra because of Anthony Albanese and his budget. And they're going to the states and saying, well, uh, we're going to put a cap on the price. Now, that takes away their royalties. But just put it in perspective in Queensland, it has the highest royalty tax in the world. They just increased it. And Anastasia Palaszczuk hasn't passed a cent on to Queensland consumers. Mm. Uh, so the, the reality is we've got to be we've got to be careful about the mechanism that they put in place. And that's why uh, we want to be constructive. We want to bring some relief to households. But it's got to be a, a model that doesn't have unintended consequences for our energy market and our yeah. resource sector, uh, the sovereign risks that can flow onto this and the jobs that, that rely on this. Because as I met with uh, the Japanese ambassador and other companies, they've all said that Australia has, be Australia has become a sovereign risk. In fact, South America is seen as a greater investment risk in the resource sector because of state governments and now the federal government because they've demonised gas companies. We could have had more supply in the system already if Chris Bowen had been prepared to have a conversation and a relationship with the gas companies. This is a supply issue. And once you increase supply, you'll reduce prices. But... Australian families are mm. going to pay the price. And, it, and I, I just suspect the two premiers are just trying to shake the, the PM down for some extra money. Uh, I, I think at the end yeah. of the day, they'll capitulate because they understand that this cost of living crisis is, is really hurting families and businesses who will start to vote with their wallets and start to reduce uh, the, people, the, the number of people they employ if something's not mm. done soon. Well, there is that adage of getting between premiers and a bucket of money. I think that applies here. But as you lay out, the East Coast energy market is really complicated. The, at a federal level, the government is trying to find a, a national solution, but perhaps that's not possible. Should it be driven by the states or, or can there be a one-size-fits-all approach? Well, it has to be driven with the states. There mm. needs national leadership. And, and this is where if uh, Chris Bauer and the Labor Party hadn't demonised gas companies, and in fact, gas companies have openly said that they would increase supply if they are given the opportunity. Now, you've got Dan Andrews, who's sitting on huge reserves uh, down in Victoria underneath his feet, but won't drill a hole. Uh, Queensland, to their credit, uh, are prepared to drill more holes. We'd have to bring in some of those environmental approvals to make sure that there's focus put on them so they can be approved in an expedited way with the right with the right regulate, regulatory boundaries around them. Right. But there are companies in my own electorate that would do this and start to increase supply. This is just simple business eight, uh, grade eight business economics. If you increase supply, prices come down. And if we look at this and we put some some boundaries also around the retailers who are moving this gas. Uh, the ACCC start leaning into them. I think we can we can look at this supply and we can solve this a lot quicker. But because the Labor Party hasn't had a relationship with the gas companies, they've demonised them. They haven't been as willing to help. Mm -hmm. uh, this was never a problem under us because we were moving coll collaboratively with uh, gas companies and industry to make sure that we always had the right amount of supply to drive down prices, even with the Ukraine crisis that was there. Uh, is that state governments have a role to play, so too the federal governments, and that's about making sure you increase the supply. Well, that said, News Poll says Anthony Albanese is as popular as ever, and after, well, what, what is it, six months since the election, it doesn't seem like they've lost any skin despite this cost-of-living crisis. What do you put that down to? 
Oh, look, uh, every government goes through a honeymoon and, and I think Australians wanted to validate that they made the right decision uh, on May 21. We accept that. And, and that's why I'm up in Queensland. I was down in New South Wales listening, understanding, rebuilding trust. Uh, and that's what we've got to do, understand what are the, what are the policies that will uh, bring Australians to understand that we have a coherent policy that's about them and their future. Uh, but I think what we will see in the future is that Australians invariably start to get frustrated when it starts... Uh, to hit their hip pocket, the policies of governments of any persuasion. Uh, so we've got to be patient, we've got to be consistent, uh, and we've got to be able to articulate those policies, those common sense policies uh, that will make sure Australians not only have cost of living pressure release, uh, but also have a future, a future for them and their families. Mm. And that's about making sure that we're honest and open with that relationship with Australian people. And that's why I'll continue to travel around the country listening, uh, particularly uh, to young families as we're getting around Queensland this week. Yeah, you're, you're in Townsville at the moment. I'll ask you about that in, in a second. But Barnaby Joyce, uh, along with a number of other Australian MPs, is about to land in Taipei this morning. There'll be five days there. They'll meet with uh, Taiwanese leaders. Given what happened with Nancy Pelosi, do you expect that this is going to provoke China? No, this isn't uh, a trip that's sanctioned by the government and the Prime Minister has been very clear on that and has been very responsible on this. And, and it's not as though we haven't had uh, MPs visit uh, areas around the globe that are contested on a geopolitical level, whether that be the Middle East or, or Taiwan. Uh, but what these MPs, uh, who are doing it on their own volition, are going to try and understand the issue. I think that's important for all uh, uh, MPs who, who may be forced to make decisions uh, one day in the future, have an understanding uh, at a grassroots level of, of exactly the issues at play in these countries. So uh, the, the government hasn't sanctioned this, the opposition hasn't sanctioned this. This is MPs from across the political spectrum that are going over to explore the issues, to understand the issues uh, from a perspective. And it's important that they also understand the issues from, from the perspective from the other side as well. And that's around open dialogue. And I think that's one thing that I've been consistent about is that the best mm. way to solve differences is through open and honest dialogue. And I had a I had a meeting with the Chinese ambassador only a couple of weeks ago, and it was okay. exactly that. And, I, and, and it was quite a warm meeting, but an honest one. And I think that's, that's the way that you resolve differences and keep security in our region. Mm. OK, you are on this uh, regional tour. You're in Townsville this morning. You love a tour. Uh, you did a tour a, a couple of uh, months ago around the country as well. And it comes at a time when the Greens have just said that they want to lower the voting age to 16. Now, I know why they do this, because traditionally uh, younger voters will vote Green, therefore they have a better chance of getting seats at the election. Is this something that you're going to test as you move around regional areas? Uh, not really. I, I think uh, I think the legal age to be to become an adult in this country to have a beer and to, to vote is 18, and I think we should respect that. And I think there is a level um, of maturity that, that is required that comes with that that honour of being able to participate in a, a free election in, in our great democracy. So I think we, we should set the bar high on that. It is, it is mm. a privilege uh, that we should we should be fierce custodians of. So. I think more that I'm hearing, uh, not only from young people, women, is, is around things that are impacting them, particularly for, for regional families here. It's about uh, accessibility to childcare. It's not affordability. Um, some of these families can't go back to work because there's no places. And we've just put $4.7 billion into subsidies. And I don't begrudge anyone getting a subsidy because the cost of living pressures are high. But I went to the job summit and said to this government, you got to understand in regional Australia, it's not just about um, affordability, it's accessibility. And unfortunately, some families can't go back to work to make 90 grand a year because uh, they can't find a place. Uh, and that's not listening to regional Australians. And unfortunately, even at the Job Summit, there was no regional uh, or rural or remote woman there to talk about childcare and the lack of access that we have here. But they're going to spend $4.7 billion just petition off some of that money, as we had, uh, to, to try and partner with, with childcare centres to increase places to get that accessibility up because that's the mm. pressure that families are feeling trying to scratch together that two grand between now and christmas they can't go and work to do it uh so we're hearing uh, plenty about that and particularly with young people i think they're more engaged about the solutions to their challenges and when they, they have and we, we can't like climate change is a big issue uh, that they yeah. talk to me about but when you talk about the new technologies of small-scale modular nuclear 
they become very engaged about our ideas about how we can reduce emissions and, and keep firming power there uh, to support renewables. Um, and so when you start talking to them at their level and, and, and at their concerns, they actually engage and understand that we're not dinosaurs, that we are looking to technology to solve the world's problems, but also to make sure that we have reliable, cheap, affordable power here in Australia. And those are the types of conversations I think empowers not only the public, but empowers me. I, I get excited <laughs> to be able to hear young people uh, and those that, that probably moved away from us at the last election uh, to get our ideas across, but to listen to theirs because there's some gems in amongst them as well. Yeah. Yep, you do get excited talking about nuclear. Uh, we'll speak to you again about it next week. David Littleproud, we'll see you soon. Enjoy Townsville.